Welcome to the Plant Free MD podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code ANTHONY to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee here again with another uh, episode of the Plant Free MD podcast. And today I'm joined by a very special guest, Dr. Rachel Brown, who is a consultant psychiatrist in the UK. And um, Rachel, thank you very much for coming on. Oh, thanks very much for having me. Pleasure yeah. to be here. Yeah, well, it's great. Um, I first want to just, just uh, for people that don't know you, can you give a, a bit of a background on yourself and tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I'm a consultant psychiatrist at the NHS in the UK. So I work in Scotland um, <clears throat> and I've been a consultant since 2011, I think, thinking back. Um, I graduated from University of Edinburgh and then kind of went straight into psychiatry training in 2004. Um, so I've been working in that field ever since then. At the current time, I'm a crisis team specialist, so <clears throat> I work, I've got one other consultant colleague and we aim to keep people out of hospital. That's the whole kind of raison d'etre for the crisis service. So we see all sorts of people, um, a lot of people acutely psychotic, suicidal, but you know, all sorts of different diagnoses and different walks of life. Um, so that, that's my main, main day job. Um, but I've obviously had an interest in nutrition and lifestyle for many years as well and um, I studied some functional medicine going back two years ago now so so um yeah a huge interest is just root cause <laughs> uh, for underlying medical conditions be what they may yeah absolutely and I mean I think that that sort of behooves uh, us as, as doctors and anyone in, in um, the medical profession to actually try to understand what's what's causing this as opposed to just putting band-aids on things because that's really not helping anyone. That's just, uh, you know, find damage control, get the, get the situation under control. Uh, you have the hazmat, you stop the bleeding, but then you have to go and fix the problem. You can't just be like, oh, job's done um, because there's obviously yeah. a lot more going on there. Yeah, and, and I have to say as, as time has gone on, that's what's really frustrated me about, about my specialty and um, the way that that we practice in mainstream psychiatry because throughout all of my training I don't think I I don't think I really thought about underlying causes all that much obviously you have to study for exams and there's certain theories you have to learn to pass exams and jump through the hoops um, but a big frustration of mine is just resorting to medication and over prescribing and yeah the list kind of goes on yeah, definitely. And so how, how did you come across um, that approach? You said you, you studied some functional medicine, but what, what, what um, obviously you had an interest in, in root causes, but what made you decide to, to search for it in that direction? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know, really. I've just always had an interest in holistic health. And, and so from a personal point of view, um, I wouldn't be somebody who would, who would go straight to pharmaceuticals if it was my health or my family's health. So I've always had an interest in more alternative type treatments. Um, you know, I've had acupuncture over the year, the Chinese acupuncture that is. And, and um, I, you know, I've got dogs actually who go to a holistic vet and are on different herbal medicines. And there's, there's all, just all of that just has always fascinated me um, for a long time. And, and I think I've probably grown um, increasingly skeptical and a bit suspicious of of the pharmaceutical industry over mm. the course of my career so far. So that's another element to it, another aspect. Yeah. And, and how did you come across uh, like a carnivore way of eating? Yeah, so, I, um, so I've been a big follower of Mark Sisson for, for as long as I can remember. So years and years and years. 
And um, so obviously like subscribe to Mark's Daily Apple and, and kind of have read all of his books and I've read all sorts of different books within this field over the years. Um, and I've been kind of primal, I would say, because I was still including dairy for, for a long time, probably about 12 years at least. I had a brief stint of being vegan, which is the biggest mistake of my life, <laughs> um, about 12 years ago now. Um, but, but prior to that, I'd been low carb and then kind of went off down a different path and ended up coming back. And um, probably for about the past six years, um, I went keto. So I wasn't properly very low carb for, for most of that. And about about six years went keto. And then I actually hadn't heard of the carnivore diet until um, Ketogenic Girl or Vanessa Spinner. She, she, she was doing a kind of personal experiment and went carnivore. And I think it was some of her social media posts. Um, and when I saw her mention it, I thought, okay, I, I really respect Vanessa's knowledge within the keto field. And um, I liked some of her meal plans and some of the other stuff that she's done. And I, and at first I thought this sounds absolutely crazy. What, what on earth? And then I just started to go down that rabbit hole. So um, I, I think it was Michaela Peterson. I watched her telling her story at Carnivory Con. Um, and then I watched Sean Baker speak at Carnivory Con as well, just two videos on YouTube. And at that point, that, that was it. That was me sold. So <laughs> that's what made me try. And I actually just ended up trying it out of, out of interest and curiosity because I didn't, I didn't think that I had any major health problems at the time. Like I wasn't really that aware because obviously I'd been low carb for quite some time and keto, um, being keto, I wasn't really aware that I had any health issues, but then going carnivore, um, it's still a learning, it's still a learning curve and a learning process, but there's definitely like retrospectively looking back, I've had quite significant improvements in, in many things that I wasn't even really aware was an issue. So um, yeah. I like what you said in some other podcasts, just about you, people end up just living with niggly sor sort of um, physical or other health issues and not really realizing it kind of mm. zone it out and it just goes into the blurs into the background, but actually my own experience was going carnivore was very enlightening. Yeah. I, I experienced the same thing as well. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I thought I felt pretty good overall. I remember this mm -hmm. period in my life where I felt unbelievable, but I never really attributed it to, you know, I stopped drinking at the time. I stopped drinking during, during the rugby season. Obviously that has a huge effect on, on your health and how you feel. And so I, I, I chalked it all up to that. And, uh, but it wasn't just that. And even so, even subsequently when I wasn't drinking, but I wasn't strict carnivore, I wasn't feeling as good as I was. I, I really wasn't, I mean, I was, I was still feeling, I was still good. I just didn't feel as like, unbelievably amazing as I normally did. And yeah. I couldn't figure out what it was. I, I was like, why am I not working out as hard? Am I not pushing myself? Am I, I was 25 then. I was, I was like, am I just over the hill? Am I dying now? <laughs> and this is my body's just shutting down. And uh, I, mean, I couldn't figure it out. But then when I went back, to carnivore, all these problems I didn't even know I had went away. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I remember thinking back at, at my life and just realizing that I felt like garbage my entire life. And it really bothered yeah. me. It made me quite upset about that, um, that I haven't been doing this the whole time. Yeah, it's really bizarre, isn't it? Because I, mm. I think when you think back to years before, it's really hard to get your head around the fact that that you were living like that, but actually you felt it was absolutely fine and everything felt normal, I suppose, because you didn't know anything better. Um, and I wasn't somebody who was living with major health problems. As I say, I didn't really have a, a specific why reason to go carnivore other than I was just very curious about it. And it, and it made sense to me when I heard all of the theory and, and, um, and it was very powerful listening to Michaela Peterson's and personal testimony as to all the kind of autoimmune health conditions that she overcame by going carnivore. <clears throat> I think probably for me, one of the, the most prominent benefits was actually just in relation to food freedom and sugar addiction. So I, I for years, had, I'd been aware I had an issue with sugar and, um, and obviously going low carb helped with that, but I didn't even realize when I was keto that there were certain foods that I think there was still some food noise around and, and addictive type behaviors around. So like nut butter was one of them, uh, you know, where I'd have a bit more compulsive type eating of, of, and find it hard to limit those foods. And I, had, I can't remember how long it was after going carnivore, but I remember there was just one day and I thought, 
you know, I don't think about food anymore. I don't get cravings for anything. I don't, I don't feel like there's any compulsion around food. And um, I can go about my life and, and just, you know, there's just a really, it's really easy. It's just very natural. And, and um, that was something that I hadn't fully experienced before, even when keto. Um, so things had been much better in keto, but, but still there were some issues. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, and I, I like what Dr. Lisa Wiederman says. So her kind of experience um, aligns very much with mine over the years in terms of the benefits she's had for, in, in carnivore in relation to kind of food addiction and sugar addiction and the, those issues. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing for me was just my immune health. So that that vastly improved. So I used to be somebody who suffered from kind of just minor colds and so on quite frequently over the years. And um, until I was ill just about four weeks ago, I'd been three years carnivore and just absolutely nothing. And, and I thought, wow, this is just amazing. Like what's what's going on? And more people need to know about this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't been sick in years. I don't, I, I used to get sick. I used to get colds all the time. And mm -hmm. um, that's why I was, you know, I always lived in, well, I grew up in Southern California, but then we moved up to Seattle and I've basically been cold ever since. And so, and then I was like living in England and Ireland and it was just freezing yeah. the whole time. And, and if I get at that time, if I got cold, if I got a chill, I would get, I would get sick. And if I wasn't very careful, I would get pneumonia because I had asthma that was, you know, I had to be, mm -hmm. I had to treat with, uh, you know, cortico, uh, you know, inhaled corticosteroids and uh, long acting bad, ag bad ag ah, agonist. And mm -hmm. so it, um, it uh, was always a problem for me. And so that, that's, that's another reason I really, really like uh, avoided the cold. I have not been sick really once. I got, I got COVID. I was down for about, a, uh, probably about a day and a half. I felt pretty miserable. And after that, you know, came out of it and I was just tired and, and, but yeah. it was over. I didn't actually feel sick. Like I normally did. And yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that sort of what you've noticed or have you just had not sick really at all? Yeah. So apart from just recently, and I've got some other theories as to why I might have been sick recently, but um, yeah, in the past three years I've kind of, yeah, similar. So I maybe had two or three occasions when, where I thought, oh no, am I coming down with something? And then 12 hours later, like all the symptoms had gone and they'd be fairly minor and then it didn't turn into anything else as it would have done previously. And I also worked face to face with people throughout the kind of last couple of years um, <clears throat> didn't take any specific pharmaceuticals for that um, and was, was absolutely fine. And I just out of interest that I ended, I ended up getting an antibody blood test for myself just to see because I thought, it would be nice to know if I've come across COVID in the last couple of years and just not known. Hmm. And so I, I did have antibodies. And so I must have come across yeah. it at some point. And, but I wasn't aware of being ill throughout that whole time. Yeah. So, yeah, well, that's good. Experience. Yeah, I remember, I remember for the first time I, I experienced that where I was, I was just feeling really tired and run down. And I was thinking, like, what, what's happening? I, I just need to eat more meat. Like, what's going on? Like, meat, meat secure. What's going to happen? You know, <laughs> I'm doing something wrong. And, um, but then I, I realized that I wasn't really doing anything wrong, but everyone around me was sick. Everyone was down with the flu. I was back in, in Seattle and my, you know, my sister was sick. My, her kids were sick. Her husband was sick. My other sister was sick. And, uh, you know, just several people in my family that had been around the whole time were, were, were sick. Um, my parents had just gone carnivore a couple months earlier, and I had been carnivore for a while at that point. And we were all feeling pretty just run down and tired, but not sick. And then I realized I was like, mm -hmm. hmm, is this what being sick feels like on carnivore? And then like the, ne the next day or two, it was completely fine. Everyone else was sick for a while. And yeah. so, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Like, how are yeah, you I think it, on that's it? amazing. Yeah. yeah. And um, speaking about uh, like food addictions and things like that, you know, as a psychiatrist, would you have uh, experience with food addiction and, and, um, and, you know, disordered eating um, and, and you know, people going through that? Yeah. So <clears throat> there are specialist services where I work for like specific eating disorder services. So I haven't, I'm not somebody who's particularly specialized in that, but I obviously come across people who are in crises for other reasons who happen to have an eating disorder as well. Um, so yeah, I, I can't speak too much about, mm. about the, the state of treatment at the moment in terms of major eating disorders, such as anorexia and bulimia mm. and binge eating disorder and so on. But I definitely 
see people with comorbidities that way. Um, so probably a lot of people with depression, anxiety, those kind of issues, sometimes other issues such as bipolar disorder. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, um, it's really difficult just personally because the vast majority of people I see have just highly processed food, junk food diets. Um, and, you know, sometimes we go out and do home visits and see people at home instead of them coming into hospital. And, you know, I've been out on visits in people's homes where they're, they're in an acute crisis, they're suicidal, they're highly distressed. And then you go out into their house and there's just bags of sweets lying around and packets of crisps. And, and um, but yeah, that's just the patients. I suppose the office is another matter. <laughs> there's quite a lot of that that we get in the office as well. Yeah, true. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just, so, yeah. So, no, yeah, sorry, so I, I mean, I, my practice has changed over the years. So I do now speak to the vast majority of people that I see to say that diet can have a significant impact on mental health. But um, it's it, it's difficult because I tend to patients tend to be under our care for two or three weeks, for example. So it's mm. not long term care before they move on to see somebody else. Yeah. Um, so my approach is to try and sow the seed and actually try to try to let people know that there are plenty of people out there with good anecdotal experiences of vastly improving their their general health as well as mental health by changing their diets yeah um, and also speak a bit about some of the evidence around metabolic health and mental health but not everybody's open to that to that message um so yeah that's frustrating yeah, it is. And, and I suppose, you know, when you're, because you're sort of in acute care, you're not going to have the, the repeated encounters with patients and then to be able to build up a you know, long-term relationship um, mm -hmm. and, and be able to sort of slowly, but surely sort of walk them in the right direction. Um, yeah. I mean, we do, we do get some people who come back to us again and again over the years. Mm -hmm. So there are, there's that cohort, um, yeah. but yeah, you're right. I'm not kind of working with somebody on an ongoing basis. Um, I did, I trained with Georgia Ede last, I think it was mm. last year. I get 2020 and 2021 all mixed up, but I think it was early 2021. Um, and I do remember her saying to me that I was in quite a difficult position, um, just in terms of working with people in the acute crisis. And that's not always the best time for somebody to do a complete overhaul of their diet. Um, but mm. also just being able to have an ongoing relationship with people to, to support them in changing changing yeah. diet but my my hope is because I work with people fairly short term we do get a large volume of people coming through our service so at least sowing a seed hopefully um and people might come back to it or you know like plant a seed and then somebody might actually decide to look into that further uh, at a later stage yeah so how how are you incorporating this into your practice now is it is it just sort of that those chance encounters with people and you sort of see that there's a you know, something that they, they might be able to improve upon that could help them. And then you try to, like, how would you, how would you sort of approach that and counsel someone? Yeah. So, I mean, I, <clears throat> I tend to always ask about what somebody's diet is like at the moment. Mm. So actually in a traditional psychiatric training sense, we don't tend to ask that. So we tend to just ask, how's your appetite? Is it, is it any better, any worse than usual? Have you lost weight or is your weight changed? And that, that would be the limit of the inquiry um so so now I do try to inquire a bit further um and sometimes you can get you can get an, an in so, so I had somebody just very recently with bipolar disorder tell me that he he doesn't follow any specific diet but he limits carbs carbs after 6 p.m so I thought oh okay hang yeah. on <laughs> yeah maybe there's something to work with here um but I have I have leaflets from Georgia Ede from that training so patient leaflets that I hand out to people I just give a brief explanation as to, to why uh, metabolic health is really important for mental health. And I'm also involved in a local trial. So there's a multi-center trial going on at the moment, looking at ketogenic diets and bipolar disorder. Hmm. Um, so that's quite nice to be able to say to people, you know, I'm part of some legitimate research at the moment that's ongoing. And I think there's just, you know, there should be some good results from these studies that are happening. Um, but I also like to emphasize that there's so much anecdotal experience out there and other psychiatrists across the world who are working in this manner that that people should really can take it seriously and, and look into into the reasons why um diet can be a huge factor in terms of optimizing their mental health longer term i'm also 
I trained with Tim Noakes Foundation, the Nutrition Network, so yeah. the South African-based Nutrition Network. So I have some leaflets from them as well that I give out to people. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so what are some of the reasons that um, metabolic health has has such a role in mental health? Oh, okay. Quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a few. Um, and that's that's the thing about this. So I think it's. I just think the body is so complex as a whole. And so I'm just going to harp on for a second about my frustrations with Western medicine or allopathic medicine. So we, we separate, um, we separate the body systems into silos and have all these tertiary specialties that don't really consider about the interactions of the different bodily systems uh, as one altogether. And so that's, that's the reason why I like functional medicine because you tend to take a holistic view of the body but yeah it'll be nice when Chris Palmer's book comes out next month so I know he's um putting a lot out there in social media in terms of um his theories and the evidence that he's pieced together and in, in terms of the close relationship between metabolic health and mental health and um, but there's there's enough research out there at the moment so we know that people with mental disorders are much more likely to have insulin resistance we know that insulin resistance in itself um, reduces your chances of responding to, well to certain treatments like lithium being a major one in bipolar disorder. Mm. Um, so people with insulin resistance are much less likely to have a good response to lithium. And lithium is our gold standard mood stabilizer in psychiatry for prophylactic treatment of bipolar disorder. Um, and you see people with rapid cycling illness and you're much more likely to have rapid cycling illness if you have insulin resistance. And then there's a huge association between type two diabetes and depression and just insulin resistance in general and all sorts of disorders, so PTSD, anxiety. Um, a lot of it comes down to inflammation in the body. So I try to explain to people about how kind of diets where you're eating constantly throughout the day, constantly spiking your blood sugar is gonna result in the release of insulin by the body. And eventually over time, you end up in this high insulin state over time and your cells eventually become insulin resistant and aren't really able to use, use the, the glucose that's in your body. Um, and I suppose Alzheimer's is one of the, the kind of most researched examples of that where um, they've demonstrated that, that there is clear um, insulin resistance at the blood brain barrier and your, your proportion of glucose in the brain is always um, a constant proportion of what's in your blood. And you end up essentially when you have insulin resistance with a brain that's swimming in glucose, but unable to access the energy. Um, and when you change over to a ketogenic diet, you um, change the, the fuel that your body is able to use. So, and, and keto, and, you know, there's so many benefits of keto. So anti-inflammatory, um, you improve the number of mitochondria in your body. And, and so the mitochondria are the powerhouse, powerhouses of energy production. So you can increase the accessible energy to your brain. Um, it just, the list goes on and on and on. So you get neurotransmitter imbalances as well when you're in an inflammatory state. Um, so kind of tipping more towards glutamate excitotoxicity and um, kind of adrenaline fueled anxiety states. So also keto being in a state of ketosis um, has the opposite effect and calms down the inflammation and, and helps to regulate your neurotransmitter balances. Great. Yeah, not, that, not that I think that um, I know like neurotransmitter theory is what's been the predominant theory for decades now in psychiatry and um, I think that's only one tiny part of, of the whole puzzle. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, most things are going to be, you know, genetic predisposition and environmental trigger, you know, when I, I mean, and that, and that's something that I think that we forget a lot, you know, we, we put so much on the genetics, we forget about okay. penetrance, you know, and like, you know, when I, I studied genetics 20, 22 years ago, that was a major part of that. You, know, you have identical twins, they have the same genes and 60% of them get the disease and 40% don't. So what's going on? Well, there's something, there's something in the environment. I always, um, actually funny enough, I said, I used to say that, you know, to, when I was painting this example to people, you know, that there's some things that are purely environmental, like getting your arm cut off, 
You know, there's nothing in your genes that can predispose you to getting your arm chopped off at some stage in your life, unless you just like a, you know, you have a gene to be like a, you know, a jerk or something like that. And, um, and, uh, and then there's something that, that is like, you know, purely genetic, you know, and I, I would use the you know, Huntington's as that, you know, and because that's, that's what I thought, that's what I was taught. This is just purely genetic. You get this, you have this gene, you will get this disease. And then I was at, and then I was like, everything else is in the middle. And, and then I was, I was just at um, a lecture series, a uh, medical conference, low carb down under where I was speaking at last weekend. And there was someone presenting on this. They actually had a case study, case study of a guy with Huntington's, had Huntington's, went like keto, did not have Huntington's, like reverse, oh, like nuts, like it blew yeah, my mind. Like, yeah. Oh. So I was like, Jesus, even that. And, and that was something that... Um, Dr. Uh, Kiltz actually said, mentioned Huntington's. He's like, I don't think so. I don't think that's purely genetic. Like, I think, I think it's all to do with diet and, uh, and, and at least uh, preliminarily on this, on that case, yeah. he was right on that, which is, I thought was pretty amazing. Oh, this is the stuff that really excites me when I hear cases yeah. like that. That's, that is amazing. I mean, I think I, I see it in kind of every, like most days at work, I think, um, we get into a very biased way of thinking about things so you know a patient will come along and you know they have a problem with alcohol or and um, they're possibly presenting for the first time with bipolar disorder and um and then as soon as somebody hears that there's someone else in the family and um, that also has that illness it's an automatic oh th this is why it's because of their genes and and there isn't really any thought paid to other reasons why somebody might be presenting now or what what other contributing factors might there be so so yeah i think i mentioned that in my book actually about just to try and give people hope that um for many years i've worked and, and consulted with patients and always felt like genetics were a major determinant in people's success and people's chances of illness but actually epigenetics is so important and in the interaction between your genes and the environment and like food is just a huge aspect of that it's not obviously the only thing but it yeah. it's a major it's an absolutely That's major component yeah well um, is it something you're putting put in, into yeah you're putting it in every day you know mm -hmm. and um, yeah day in and day out <laughs> for yeah. years and years yeah absolutely yeah um, yeah and then and you know what people forget too is that yes genetics run in families but so do habits and, uh -huh. uh, and traits, you know, so oh. yeah, you know, you have, you have people's eating habits and, you know, a child isn't going to feed themselves. They're not going to go through, you know, you know, go shopping on their own. Uh, they, what their parents give them, maybe, you know, maybe they fight yeah. it, but that's, that's what their options are. And so they generally learn their habits, their eating habits from their parents for better or worse. And then that, you know, continues on and passes on. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, um, yeah, I quite often think about that in relation to my son and um, he eats way more meat now than he ever used to. And he doesn't tend to get sick nowadays either, um, but he's not car he's not fully carnivore by any means. But, you know, had I known what I'd known years ago when he was born, I probably would have done things very differently. Mm -hmm. But then I think about just when he goes to children's parties and the sort of food that everyone served there. And then it is inevitably pizza and chips and, and kind of junk food. And um, thankfully, it's so obvious he has a problem with gluten that I can say he has to be gluten free and I at least, at least minimize some of that toxicity. Yeah. But then they come home with a bag full of sweets. And um, I mean, these days, just from a cultural point of view, it's very difficult, very difficult yes. to, to, to kind of go against the grain and, and, um, and to make children, I know some people do, but uh, I think it's difficult once they've started down the journey of kind of sugar addiction to actually extract them fully from that. Um, so yeah, well, I think it, I, yeah, it definitely is, and uh, I mean, especially because of how addictive it is, and and no one no one considers it like fully yeah. addictive. Oh yeah, no, no, totally, no, 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 it actually is like an actual drug. And, yeah. um, and people don't, don't recognize that and they don't recognize just how bad it is. They think it's just something sweet and, oh, it's an empty calorie. Oh, it's not that great for them, but is it that bad for them? Yes, it is horrible for them. And I think if people recognize just how bad this stuff was for their kids, they would never let them have it. Or at least, you know, I, I don't think they would, they would 
they would responsibly let their their kids have mm-hmm. it. You know, there's like you say, you know, you come to this late, and there it, yeah. it, it can be quite difficult. But um, it's um, I, I think that we should we should at least try to change the atmosphere around sugar and not just be like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. We should we should treat it like what it is. It is a big deal. And, um, you know, and, uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the main thing is, is, is just trying to raise your kids in a way that they they'll say no on their own, just like with you know, drugs, alcohol, yeah. and cigarettes as well. Well, yeah, definitely. So he, he's quite funny. You know, he's 10 and he, he make, he comes out with comments like, and one day he just said to me, Oh, from now on mom, I just want to have meat. I just want my breakfast, my lunch, my dinner to be meat. He just turned around one day and said that to me. And I said, Oh, really? And then he's like, oh, apart from maybe a dessert. <laughs> yeah. And um, he makes me laugh. But I, I think, yeah, he's open-minded and he listens and he understands. He's intelligent enough. He understands when I try to explain to him, you know, the reasons why meat would be healthy and, and sugar is not. And so I, can, I think he is able to make choices. But I, I think it's more difficult with um, older people who've just be- become used to to living in this way. and. So, so yeah, some people close to me, an example is, well, I'm 70, whatever years old, and it hasn't done me any harm so far. And I think it's because the the length of time between the, the toxin or the, the adverse effect from the food actually having a very obvious negative health consequence, mm. um, that, that's why people get away because they don't, you know, they're not going to drop down dead as soon as they eat a piece of sugar. But what they don't realize is just the damage that they're doing to their bodies over time. And I think part of the challenge of getting the message across is that people end up living in this state like we spoke about in the beginning, which is a, a far from optimal state, but it doesn't necessarily feel acutely diseased or painful enough to the person to think that they need to do something to change. It just becomes a, a normal, it, they just normalize that experience, I suppose, is what happens. Yeah. And we, and we consider it, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. And, and, you know, it's, it's like if we were considering, you know, cocaine or something like that, not that big of a deal. And, mm. you know, we, you could consider that that way. And, and in, certainly in, in, you know, centuries past, um, not that people necessarily thought it was not a big deal, but they didn't, they didn't consider it as detrimental as it, as it is now. And then, you know, you have maybe people that were just like, no, no, this is actually really, really bad, you know, and then so, uh, yeah, and you have to sort of look at that in that way, but um, it, you are going against the tide and it can be very difficult for people, especially when you're, you're in the middle of that situation, you're not really sure of yourself and everyone's having it and you sort of feel a social pressure to have the sugar and you, and you, and, and people look at you weird because they don't think it's that big of a deal, but they do it for, for other, other drugs as well, like alcohol and things like that. Yeah. And you're out drinking they're Oh, why don't you have a drink? Oh, why don't you have a drink with us? Oh, it's much more fun when you, and they give you these guilt trips. They're you know, like these dare commercials when I was a kid doing these exact things like, Oh, what do you chicken and all that sort of stuff. Oh, really? And it's like, it was the same thing. We do this with food as well. Yeah. I mean, and alcohol is a huge one. So mm. like, it looks, it's more taboo not to drink anything or to say that you're not drinking anything than to actually have something. Yeah. Um, it's, and there's so much societal pressure, particularly in Scotland. Um, I, know, yeah. I know you spent some time in England and rug, mm-hmm. the whole rugby scene and mm-hmm. you know what that's all about. But yeah. I think, dare I say, it, it's probably even worse up here in Scotland. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I, you know, you when I first went to Scotland, drinkers. Yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. I definitely drank a lot when I was in Scotland. <laughs> I was like 22. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> you know yeah 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 but yeah you're right people do the same exact thing with food and you know oh, one piece couldn't hurt or yeah. oh live a little you know those sorts of comments um and actually I, I don't like I had I've had such a sweet tooth my whole life and I could take or leave you know starchy carbs so like potatoes and pasta and all that kind of stuff that, that wasn't the stuff that bothered me but actually the longer I've been away from it all, I, I don't have any desire to have that stuff. Um, I don't miss it. I don't crave it. And it's such a different way to to exist and to be around all that stuff. And I can have all that stuff around me and it's just not an issue. It's just not an issue yeah. at all. And I, yeah. I spent years thinking, I spent years thinking I had, I was an emotional eater or had some sort of emotional type eating problem. Um, but actually it was just, yeah, all pure sugar addiction mm-hmm. yeah. yeah plain and simple yeah i always love that term you know oh live a little live a little i think it's it's more 
uh, apps than people realize. It's just like, it will make you live a little. Like I'd rather yes. live a lot, you know? So I'll, yes. I'll, I'll not eat that and I'll live five decades longer than you. Thank you very much. I'll appreciate it. I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll enjoy those five decades more than that, yeah. you know, piece yeah, of I think there was, um, or something. I think there was a shop where we were, I can't remember if it was um, when we were away recently or if it was locally, but there was a shop we were driving past and it, it's called Heavenly Desserts. And and just my first thought was, well, you know, they're going to get you to heaven faster. That's all I think now about those yeah. things. That's not what most people will be thinking looking at that. No, yeah, it is funny. You do look at, you look at things more and and you start seeing like, well, that's poison. I never eat that. And it's like, especially going around the hospital. My God, oh. it, it's so frustrating every day. Mm -hmm. It's just just carbs and sugar, carbs and sugar. I was like, this is a hospital, and yeah. and you're feeding people sugary nonsense. And yeah. it's it's one thing to not consider carbohydrates damaging, but to but to but to give people shovel in sugar, and I mean shovel in. Um, they they did a they sent out this list of all the different foods and the categories like green category, yellow category, red, like green oh. you have as much as you want, whenever you want. It's just, it's only good at all times. Yellow I is just flip it right. yeah. 100%. The, um, one of the, one of the top foods, it was like, it had a 100 rating was watermelon of all things. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was like right. eat as much watermelon as you want. It's just a superfood now. And, um, and and Kellogg's Frosted Flakes, that was in the green. Eat as much as you want, whenever you oh. want. Not not even the corn flakes, but the Frosted Flakes. Oh, that that takes me back to being a teenager because I think that's what I had for breakfast <laughs> every morning. Well, that's um, but yeah. that's horrendous, horrendous, and you can just see the influence of money there, can't you? In big corporations and the influence that they've had in, in developing those guidelines, which yeah. They're all a bunch of nonsense, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and a lot of people go by the guidelines. I, I, um, I was talking to someone uh, the other day at the conference and, and they were, they were saying they got, they got into an argument with, it, or, you know, a bit of a disagreement with, uh, you know, their head of the department uh, about, you know, something. And, and they were saying, well, you, you can't treat people like that or whatever, like, you know, something low carb and, and I said, but this is, this is evidence-based. This is evidence-based. Just look at the studies, look at this, look at that. You know, it's all there. It's, it, this, is, this is very, very substantial evidence. And that's what's driving my practice. And, and the, the person was just being, you know, refusing to even look at it. I said, well, why don't you just look at the studies? Why don't you just look at the evidence and see what you think? And, and this was like head of a department at a major hospital. And they said, I don't care what the evidence says. I only care what the guidelines say. Oh, yeah. 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 That, uh, yeah. Just talk about the complete opposite of being open minded and critical thinking. And just, yeah, awful. Yeah. Awful. But I mean, that goes on just all the time in, in every single way, really, doesn't it? It's, um, yeah, it, it's a huge frustration. Um, yeah. I just have to hope that, you know, something really nice recently. I had a consultation with a patient and, um, like somebody with bipolar disorder who's had pretty severe episodes of illness um for and, and was diagnosed like many years ago so he's been living with the illness for 20 plus years at this point in time and and he came to our service on five or six different psychotropic medications including lithium and was saying to me that he's been depressed for throughout this whole year um, so so was in hostel yet last year and just has never like recovered to an extent but never fully recovered and uh, and I just I just took one look at his list of medications and thought okay fine so from a, a traditional psychiatric point of view there are two different medicines that we could increase at this point um, to even worsen overall your whole cocktail of medications that you have already um, including some of the worst ones in terms of giving people insulin resistance, never mind um, anything else. Mm. Um, and I thought, oh, at the end, I just I need to I need to mention ketogenic diet to this person because I don't think they've heard of it at all. They don't know anything at all. And they said to me they tried other lifestyle interventions, you know, like exercise and all sorts of different things. And I thought this is somebody who's actually interested in trying to get to the root cause of their illness and try to make their life better. Um, and anyway, I gave him, we sat for a while and spoke about everything and I left all the information with him and, 
um, it was just really nice because he seemed really appreciative and said, oh, thanks very much for mentioning this. I'm going to look into it. And um, and he's somebody I, I don't doubt that he will look into things because he, he seems like a very well educated sort of person and somebody actually interested in, in looking after their health and trying to improve their situation. Mm. And so it's kind of moments like that 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 really excite me um, in amongst the, the, I suppose, monotony at this point of still being in mainstream sort of practice um, with all the prescribing that goes on within that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you... I know, I think I've heard you before speaking about how your goal is to put lots of doctors out of business and how you would, you would yeah, love for that to happen. And I, I feel equally <laughs> the same because I, it would be amazing if people actually could make changes to their lifestyle, <laughs> excuse me, and diet and um, end up not having to darken the doors of, psychiatrists again or be admitted to hospital and it's not the most pleasant place to be by any means no i think i think it would be amazing and i think i think it would i think it'd be much more satisfying for doctors as well because you you get back to actually helping people and getting them better uh, there's always going to be acute emergencies there's always going to be injuries there's always going to be you know mm -hmm. acute you know, psychoses that you know someone needs real help and yeah. and but this uh, there's just this chronic inflammatory state where everyone's just everyone's just mm -hmm. toxic you know that that's mm -hmm. not normal and that's you don't need a doctor for that you need a you need a you need a farmer and <laughs> you, know, you need to to sort of yeah. get on get on good foods and then and then your body will just just work properly and there have been doctors for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years and there were like medicine men and wise you know you know wise women things like that long before that and so there's always going to be a role for that and um, I think that that if we if we get back to how how it was, where we were really focusing on the things that people actually couldn't solve themselves, I think I think the world is going to be a better place. And I think I think doctors are going to be much more engaged as well. And I think patients are going to be more engaged in their own life. And then you have a lot of people with a lot of education and a lot of know how actually putting their their effort and their intelligence into very very useful directions, as opposed to just spinning our wheels putting bandages on toxicities you know yeah. and treating and you know like treating or yeah trying to put a plaster over a condition and just treat symptoms as opposed to underlying disorder and they prescribe a medication and then the person ends up with side effects from the medication so the, then the answer is prescribe another medication to counteract the side effects from the first one and and so it continues and and I don't know about you, but I see patients quite frequently who end up on just so many, so many medications, and particularly if they see different doctors or kind of less experienced doctors. Sometimes people just feel like they need to do something, but it's like there's a real lack of critical thinking around what, what other possibilities might there be here other than just reaching for a prescription pad. Um, and yeah, it really frustrates me the the kind of state of medicine these days. Um, particularly, I suppose I'm particularly thinking about GP practices, but also, I mean, it's this sort of um, this sort of practice and, and prescribing is rife throughout all specialties. I think so. It would be unfair to say it's just GPs. It's definitely psychiatrists, um, myself included. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just across the vast majority of, of fields. I think and. Just the wrong approach and I, I quite often think why do people go into medicine surely most people go into medicine because they ultimately want to help people um, and where does that get lost along the way and but that's probably a whole other conversation about the influence of medical education and mm -hmm. and um pharmaceutical industries there and, and but, but i think that that's also why a lot of doctors burn out you know because mm -hmm. it, it isn't it isn't as satisfying as as uh that is, is is it it was supposed to be you know it's not as altruistic they're not actually like really helping people it's just this grind and you just have these people that just have this all these same problems all these things and and the system's overloaded and you really can't help them and they have to wait years to see you you have to wait years to get any sort of practical uh solutions Sur certainly in surgery you know here in um in australia it's it's a four and a half year wait is what we have right now for people in uh, you know category three, so the you know lower you're not going to die, you're not going to lose permanent function, you're just in horrible pain, and you haven't been able to work for five years. You know, well, you can handle it. Okay, fine, but you know they're not going to die, but they can't really live very well either, and they do need help. 
And it's, it's very difficult, you know, because it's, um, and then you sort of have the same sort of thing for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I think, I think people just do get a little bit burnt out from that. And because mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's not what, what they got into it for in the first place. And I think a lot of people like yourself, like myself, like, you know, Dr. Uh, you know, Pran Yanathan, like, sort of seen this and went like, you know, this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't making me happy. Mm -hmm. And then we found these alternates. I, I love surgery. Like I love doing that. I love being able to do that for people. And I love learning about it. I think it's just fascinating, but mm -hmm. I want to be able to do it when it's necessary, not just because, yeah. you know, people are just killing themselves from the inside mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and, and then being able to treat people like in functional medicine, practice and, and just watching them get better and watching them come off their medications and drop their blood pressure and drop their weight mm -hmm. and get rid of all these issues that they've had for, for years and years and years is so satisfying. It is so fulfilling. Yeah. I like, um, I'm just thinking of Sean Baker's account there of when he was doing surgery and then all the lifestyle advice he gave people and it ended up, he was taking people who were coming off surgery lists because they they'd got on top of their inflammation and no longer needed the knee surgery or whatever it may have been. Mm. And, uh, and then of course he ended up getting into trouble with the hospital, not being very happy because they're not going to make the money that they wanted to make. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, that's such a warped backward system uh, when you really yeah. take a step back and think about it. Yeah. When, uh, and Gary Fetke, um, similar situation mm -hmm. here in Australia, uh, Australian mm -hmm. orthopedic surgeon and, yeah. and he was, he was doing the same thing. He was, he was actually trying to be a real doctor and actually really help people as opposed to just, you know, mint cash and by, you know, chopping people up and unnecessarily. And so he's saying, Hey, you know, you change your diet and you may not need surgery and, uh, and you can get better and you can lose weight and you won't have these problems. And it was working and, and, mm -hmm. you know, people were getting better and they were very appreciative. And then, you know, a dietitian yeah. at his hospital caught wind of it and was like, oh, well, he's a doctor. He, he can't. He can't give diet advice. He's not a dietitian. Well, you know, we're doctors and, and the entire purpose of being a doctor is to help yeah. people uh, get better and, and, and to help people optimize their health. And before there was ever the first dietitian, there were doctors who dealt with what people were eating. You know, I mean, this goes, back, I think it's attributed to Hippocrates, but I don't think, I don't know if he ever actually said it, but, you know, let, let, uh, food be thy medicine and medicine, thy food. Right. This is, this is basic tenets. And there was even older than that. There was an ancient Egyptian uh, proverb that said, um, one quarter of what you eat is for you. Three, the other three quarters is for your doctor. Yeah. The one quarter of your food feeds you and three quarters of your food feeds you, of, of what you eat feeds your doctor. They say, okay. you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. because you're going to stay sick and you're going to keep seeing the doctor and you're going to be paying his bills. And, but you don't have to, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, that's a major thing. And, and you know, Dr. Fecky, like he, he got a, a very hard time. He was in court for years oh. uh, being challenged on this because they said, yeah, you, you can't be going around giving people you know, advice on their health. What, what do you think you are? And yeah. of course he won, but it, it cost him a lot of money and a lot of heartache and just years off his life. And was that from his medical regulator, whatever the, I don't know what's called in Australia, but. Um, APRA. Yeah. So it was okay. the medical governing body. They, they took exception yeah. to this. They, they took yeah. uh, this nutritionist complaint very seriously. And they thought that this was something that, that uh, was, you know, was not in his wheelhouse and wasn't something that he should mm -hmm. be commenting on. And, mm -hmm. you know, so they, they took him to court and, uh, and he won, which was good, but it, it, cost it was very very expensive you know as as, as mm -hmm. most court battles are and yeah. took years and years and years which is very stressful and very you know harmful to his his mental health mm -hmm. and um yeah. and so that was that was quite difficult for him yeah. but but he wanted Noakes is somebody else yeah Tim Noakes is somebody else who's been through something similar um yeah I, I don't have a lot of faith in these regulatory bodies at all because I think um they uh, a lot of it's very subjective. So they allocate um, a specialist, you know, from their, their service just to oversee a complaint or whatever it may be. And then they just compare against kind of standard practices or someone in my specialty, it's like someone's opinion. So someone can end up looking through a bunch of case notes and just giving a, a kind of diagnostic opinion on a patient who they've never actually met and just draw conclusions from that. Um, 
So yeah, I yeah, I'm just wary. I'm wary of all of those organizations and their ability to actually be objective and, and not mm. um influenced by other other, you know, aspects of money or, you know, whatever whatever their influences may be. Um yeah, it's very sad, I think. But mm. I suppose another thing is no such thing as negative publicity. So in a way, what happened with Tim Noakes um you know, it, it was really nice to read his book and very satisfying, you know, that he got through that whole battle, that legal battle. But yeah, he's not the only one who's had it, mm -hmm. um, which is disappointing, but maybe not surprising. Yeah. And, it's, and of course, you do need some sort of regulation in these things. You have to make sure things are safe. But uh, yeah, I mean, these these sorts of things can can get a life of their own and, and get a bit out of control. And, you know, in, in the guys, in, in you're know, trying to do the right thing, but then you kind of sort of lose sight of what that is and, and what you say and what you think turns into the right thing. Whereas mm -hmm. it might not necessarily be the case. It may just be your, you know, your opinion and then their opinion becomes law uh, with these regulator, yeah. like, regulatory bodies. Um, and certainly that was, seems to be the case in, in um, Gary Fecky's case, because even after he won, he, he went to the Supreme Court, he went all the way up to the top, and then he won. And even after that, they still tried to prosecute him again, said, no, you can't do that. And he said, um, guys, we've been here, we've done this, you know, yeah. here's, the, here's the ruling. And they said, no, we're, we're telling you, you can't do this. And so we had to take him to court again and, uh, and had to go through it all again. So it was a bit, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult to know where the balance is on that. But I think it's definitely, I think, I think wherever you, wherever someone agrees on where the line is, I think, I think, I think most people would agree we're past it in, in a lot of these cases. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, you, you mentioned your research. What, what, what is, uh, what is that research project and, and what are you guys, uh, how's that going? Oh, um, yeah, so it's going good. It's a pilot study at the moment. Um, it's a kind of multi-site, so Stanford is one of the other sites, and there is a university in Australia, but I forget the name of it exactly, that's also doing it, and it's a kind of small clinical study, um, still recruiting patients at the moment, but putting people with bipolar disorder onto a ketogenic diet um and over about six weeks, and then analyzing the results. I think the the, stu the studies in the different centers are, are each designing their own study and, and maybe t measuring different parameters and doing different investigations. Um, but, but from an Edinburgh point of view, it's going well so far. So it'll be interesting to, to see what comes of that. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I really liked the, the French study that was out not that long ago. Um, I think Georgia Ede had some involvement with it, but wasn't the main researcher. But I quite often mention that to patients as well when I'm seeing them, just the, the outcomes that people can get when they they adopt and that's just a ketogenic diet so mm -hmm. so that's one step um but i'm i'm in touch with so many different people in the carnivore community who mm. have transformed their mental health by following a, a carnivore diet that i think there's just so much more potential in the future for for benefit in terms of all sorts of different mental health conditions um so it was really interesting there's somebody on instagram who is the first person with borderline personality disorder who um, is saying that carnivores completely revolutionized their mental health wow. and um, so that's somebody I follow and I don't know of anybody else but but um, I've been doing some Q&A sessions with Bella's steak and butter mm -hmm. gang recently and, and a few people have asked me about personality disorder and carnivores so um, obviously some of it's speculative just now but I, I, I was very taken by this one person's account so somebody who struggled with their mental health since and a childhood, teenage years, and is saying that all of their their kind of interpersonal difficulties and anxiety issues and, and just everything is it's like they're a new person after going carnivore and they just can't believe <laughs> kind of what's happened and how did they not know about this before? So I, I just think there's so much more to come in the future. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whether absolutely. we'll get the studies on it, I don't know. But but if there are enough people giving their own experience, and I think that should be. That should be enough. I hope I so. Think, yeah. Yeah. I think real life experience, you just, you can't argue with that. And I, I constantly say to patients till I'm kind of blue in the face that statistics don't necessarily apply to an individual. And, mm -hmm. you know, we can quote all these statistics from various studies or trials, but actually 
your n of one is what really matters and it's about your own experience and um kind of yeah. trying things out and seeing if they work yeah well that's the thing you know it's like you know, I, I tell people when i'm like, consenting them for a surgery or procedure you know it's, it's you know five percent of this and two percent of that and less than one percent of this other thing but if it happens to you it's a hundred percent you know it's absolutely that's what really matters and it doesn't matter that like oh well you know 99.9 percent .9 of people you know don't have this horrible side effect but you got it so who cares and um yeah. then you see people uh, talking about like, well, this person had these, these, uh, you know, amazing results and, and, you know, re you know, got off their medication, stopped having psychiatric issues or personality issues. And they say, yeah, whatever, that's anecdotal. It's like, okay, well, I guess it didn't happen then. You know, yeah. I guess they just, yeah, I guess that, that just doesn't exist. You know, their, their own, own reality is just, yeah. you know, that's not, that's not real, you know? And, and oh, yeah. yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, I was just going to say, how can that possibly be irrelevant to yeah. other people? Like you've got an actual living person with mm. who's not in a controlled environment, who's dealing with all the stresses day to day that like lots of other people might have to deal with, but coming from their own kind of genetic background and environmental influences. And yet man, they've maybe suffered from a major illness for years and years, and then they make lifestyle changes and, and put their difficulties into remission. Like, how can that be ignored? And that's yeah. the best test that there is, really. Yeah. A real life test, not not something artificial in a lab or in a very highly controlled environment. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's frustrating. It is, yeah. And and yeah. and again, like and why do we do case studies and case reports in medicine if if the end of one doesn't matter at all? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That gives you an idea of a new direction. That's what that is. You say, look at this, this is different, this is interesting. We don't see this very often look at this and you yeah. describe, and you, you describe you know, new diseases and things like that. I mean, that's how, that's how we got the names for most of these diseases. People were like, Oh, Hey, look at this. Yeah. I saw this today. They wrote it up, you know, yeah. and, and named um, it after themselves. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah. So that'd be great. Mate, I was thinking in medical school, I was like, everything's been named, you know, all these things have been named, you know, and I was just like, am I, am I, how am I going to get my name on something? Like, everything's, been, everything's been done, but I guess, you know, everyone's thought that, at, well, as they're going through it because that's just what they know and then you have to sort of learn enough so that you can know where to push the boundaries so maybe i can maybe i can get something someday you know <laughs> <laughs> one of these things yeah yeah, um, they do they do um they do talk about doctors being inherently narcissistic too, yeah. They? yeah sorry definitely. that's just like one of my favorite topics but it's something that that comes to mind yeah well that's what they, they say right that's the joke is um you know what's the difference between god and a neurosurgeon God doesn't think he's a neurosurgeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have heard that one. Yeah, <laughs> and um, when I was going through through medical school, um, just speaking about you know naming things, uh, apparently there was a doctor in Dublin who started doing uh, he was doing a lot of autopsies and dissections and um, you know, cadaveric dissections, mm. and there was a guy who came in from the country and he had you know come in and died sometime in Dublin and they got him and he opened him up. And they found this like in the 1800s, you know, there was a bunch of coal smoke everywhere and opened his lungs up and he found this very abnormal pathology in his lungs, uh, which was they were completely miscolored and misshapen. They were very pink and, and very, you know, you know, you know, big and buoyant where normally it's supposed to be like black and crackled. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so he, he wrote this up as this is like this new pathology may have, maybe have died of, of pink lung disease. And, uh, you know, and of course, <laughs> this is, you know, just not for having all this, this coal smoke in your lungs. And my, my anatomy professor just said, so you ne so be careful because you never want to be known as the pink lung guy, you know, sure. you know the guy who discovered pink lung. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's just a face palm moment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny though. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Um, just, just for people who don't know, just, just, uh, quickly, I know, uh, you need to leave, but you mentioned the Georgia Ede study. That'd be great to get your take on that, you know, as, as an actual, uh, psychiatrist. Yeah. So I, I mean, I thought it was a really exciting, encouraging study. So it was on inpatients. I forget the exact numbers, but, um, I, I forget the proportions. Sorry. I think it was 32. If I my memory. Yeah, I was thinking it was around 30, but um, I don't tend to have a brain that retains these sort of facts. <laughs> um, but a whole a mix of diagnoses, so depression, schizoaffective, 
I think some schizophrenia and bipolar in, in there. And, um, you know, he, like all of them improved. Um, a vast proportion managed to reduce medication. Some managed to come off medications. Um, and so it was just just really highly encouraging. And, and that was about a ketogenic diet. Um, mm. And I think they did include in the study the what the diet was made up of. Um, but there were even aspects to it that, that it could be improved upon. So I'm even thinking about the ketogenic study that I'm involved in. I came into it quite late and um, there, was a, there was a food list just because I hadn't been aware they were doing it, but I found out from another colleague about it and then instantly thought, oh, I need to get involved. Um, and when I looked up the patient information uh, details, um, some of the stuff on the food list was a bit dubious. So like mayonnaise, for example. And I thought, oh, no, but why, why are they having all the inflammatory vegetable oils in this study? Because this is going to mm. this is going to affect the outcome. But anyway, mm. my point being that I, I think people are going to improve anyway. But I think yeah. with a lot of these studies, there are further improvements that could be made. And. And as I say, um, who knows what a carnivore study, if there was ever one do done in mental health, would actually show. Um, and I, I think there would be great potential for that, just considering carnivore to be a subset of the ketogenic diet. Um, and I think food intolerances are huge issues for people. So I know that's kind of another topic we maybe don't have a lot of time to discuss today. But um, I do know from Georgia's training that she was very clear. She's worked with patients for years now using ketogenic diets. And um, I remember her giving an example of a patient she'd seen who managed to narrow down their anxiety attacks or their panic attacks to one specific food. And um, mm -hmm. I think they'd been troubleshooting things for a while and, and playing around with different ketone levels. And it was actually keeping a food diary and um, like where both of them managed to pinpoint it was one specific food. And when they excluded that food from her, her diet, the kind of panic attacks just never came back. Um, right so, yeah so, yeah i think there's so much that could be explored um that isn't even being done now in terms of research so yeah yeah well, that, well that's a great thing about the carnivore diet is it is a true elimination diet and and you maybe someone will have a bigger reaction to one thing than the other but yeah. this gets rid of everything and so you know getting getting rid of the carbs and the sugar is massive but you know, yeah. there are other things as well and this gets rid of all of them and then you know maybe you you sample some things back and they go wham give you a big big uh, reaction yeah. you go okay stay away from that one but maybe you can yeah, incorporate yeah. other things in as well if you want to i mean i don't personally but um mm -hmm. but you know if you if you were uh of that mind you could you could sample things back in and and to and to, to try to avoid like the major reaction and then and then go from there but um yeah you know, i have to I have to thank you actually for the coffee thing so um oh yeah <laughs> So just some of the podcasts you put out there when you've discussed coffee. So I, I, um, I know that coffee puts up my triglycerides because I did some blood, blood mm. tests on myself. And um, so I knew quite a while back I need to just stop the coffee. And I, I used to have uh, like two or three espressos every morning before I would, this was pre-carnivore, but before I'd even go out to work, I was that, I was that person. <laughs> and um, I remember giving up coffee during pregnancy. I never had any withdrawal symptoms. It was absolutely fine just to avoid it years ago. But um, anyway, I, I, because of my triglycerides, I thought, okay, I really need to stop this. It's probably not doing me any good. Um, and then I kind of slipped back into it every so often. And, and at some points, I'm not somebody who's suffered from anxiety before. But for me, after a caffeinated coffee, there were a few times I just thought, oh, I feel like I'm feeling anxious. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose I just want to point that out, particularly for people with mental health problems, just the, mm. the impact coffee can have. And then the other really odd thing that happened, it was um, my son's school sports day. Um, this was in the last year, I forget exactly when. And there was a coffee cart at the, at the day. And I've got such a like positive association with coffee just being like a special sort of thing. And my husband said, should we get a coffee? And I just thought, oh, yeah, to heck with it. I'm just going to have one. And it, it must have been like really poor quality coffee. And that evening I had like sudden onset, awful pain in my left wrist that I've never had before in my life. Oh, wow. Um, ever. And it was, it was pretty bad. So it was still sore the next day, but less so, but just really unpleasant. And I'm not somebody who has joint pain at all ordinarily. And I thought it can only be the coffee because there was nothing else that was different then. And so I didn't have coffee for a while. And then I think I had another one and it was okay. And then the second time I had from a, a cafe that we've been to over the years and I kind of trust what they 
what they do and what they serve. So not from a dodgy coffee cart at a school sports day. Um, and I had a coffee, one coffee that day, that evening, same pain, same risk. And I just thought, okay, that's it absolutely confirmed for me now. Yeah. It's gone. <laughs> yeah. So um, and I just well, it just made me think of your story about, I think was it a work colleague who'd you'd done a hard session with in the gym and then they were saying that the next day they didn't have any delayed onset muscle soreness and then somebody a rep or something somebody brought around coffee and then they'd partaken in the coffee and then suddenly they had aches and pains later that day so that's yeah. that's the story that kind of stuck in my mind um, yeah yeah I had a, I, I that was when I, I tested it uh, because I wasn't I wasn't getting sore I was like, what, the, what is going on? Like, how, why am I not getting sore? Am I, am I not working out hard enough? I'm not pushing myself or what? And so that's when I ended up doing like 32 sets of heavy legs and, um, and just, it could have kept going, but like, I just, I was been there for four hours and I had things to do. I was like, okay, well, this, I'm done with that. And, uh, and the next day I wasn't sore, but I, I was like really worried about that. I was like, I was like, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to walk for a month. And the next day I was fine. I was going up the stairs two at a time and I could sort of feel like, okay, yeah, you know, my legs, something's happened, but I could do it again. And I had no problem. I went hiking up a mountain the next, that day, went to, and I was like, right, I'm ready to go to rugby. Like I'm ready to get back playing. And this is when not working out for a very long time, went to rugby practice, dead sprint the whole time, kept up with the, the team. Everyone had been training the whole time I was in Bangladesh volunteering in the refugee camps. And so they were in very good shape. I was not in good shape and I was keeping up with everything, all the drills, all the sprints. And the next day I still wasn't sore. The day after that, I still wasn't sore. And then I met up with a, a friend of mine for coffee. I hadn't had coffee in a number of weeks. So I said, okay, well, let's, let's see what this does. You know, can I have coffee? Is coffee going to be okay? One cup of black coffee from, you know, a nice place. Yeah. And within 20 minutes, my hamstrings were getting tight and stiff. My back started getting stiff and aching. I'm like, okay, okay. What's happening? What's happening? I could feel it in real time. And, yeah. and I was sore for two days after that. You know, not not nearly to the extent that I justly deserved after doing something as stupid <laughs> as I did, but yeah. still very, still quite sore and and you know way more than I wanted it to be. So that for me was just like right. Well, I know that this is causing inflammation in my body. I know this is doing things that I don't want, and so that's just, that was just it for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's very dramatic and memorable, isn't it? Mm. It's not something that you're going to forget. Uh, yeah. anytime soon it's the same for me just with my even even though it was single joint sort of pain I just thought what on earth is going on yeah and, no it's uh, not yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, enough no coffee it. no pain so that's it it's yeah. as simple as that you know you don't don't take the poison you don't get poisoned it's it's, yeah. it's amazing how that works you know yeah yeah <laughs> you, didn't, you don't need to go to medical school to figure that one out yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> true <laughs> Well, great. All right. Well, well, Dr. Brown, it was, it was absolutely lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, you have a book out and, um, and social media presence and, and where can people find you and how do they find your book? Okay. Um, so on social media, I'm just on Instagram and I'm carnivore shrink on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And um, my book is called metabolic madness and that's on Amazon. So, um, so it was, it's a kind of, it's quite a brief read. I wanted it to be that way. And I just wanted to make all the reasons why people need to look at their diet for their mental health accessible and kind of but it does cover a lot of the research as well in an accessible sort of way so yeah good that's me lovely so thanks thanks so much i've really enjoyed that conversation thanks for yeah. having me oh well, you're very welcome it was a pleasure okay. great all right we'll have to do it again <laughs>